Welcome everybody to uh, the 2009 Harborview Spine Symposium. I'm going to start this talk with just a bit of a brief vignette to sort of set it off um, in the statement that it's a great time to be a spine surgeon. And I think a lot of us believe that because of the advances in instrumentation and knowledge of disease and approaches and all. But I'm going to take that a little bit of a different slant on this and suggest that there are some issues about it being a great time to be a spine surgeon. One of these is that we live in a world of unclear surgical indications. And probably the best example of that is in back pain. Now, let's just say the resident walks in the room and presents to you a patient with the following uh, description. Single black disc, vigorously tried non-operative treatments, positive discogram, negative controls, employed, working despite the pain, no litigation, no workman's compensation, not taking narcotics. Um, now, even the most hard-hearted person that's against back pain surgery may just say, well, this patient, maybe I'll consider this is one of the rare ones I'll look at. And anybody who does back pain as part of their living is going to go, wow, this is perfect. The imaging, single level black disc, perfect di discs at the other level, it's going to really lead you into considering what you, that you're going to maybe help this patient. And all the things up to now can be described in a standard study format. Oswestry, ODI, et cetera, we can all, all uh, 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 describe this scientifically in terms of a study. However, let's say we walk in the room and this is the group we see. Now even the most hard-hearted person is probably going to go, wow, uh, I'm going to talk to this patient for a while because I think I can probably help him even if I don't do spine surgery. On the other hand, if the other group is seen, then I think even the most adamant back pain surgeon is going to go, no, not this one, let's, let's talk for a bit and then I'm going next door. Um, and those are not describable in a scientific fashion. It'll never be described in materials and methods or in the demographics uh, description of the inception cohort. So it's kind of the basic problem with how much gestalt we use in choosing on whom we operate. The other thing is that there's a lot of unclear surgical techniques. We're all a bit of a gadgeteer and we all like new things. And there's a lot of ways to get to Rome. Anterior, posterior, anterior and posterior, minimally invasive, mini open. There are tons of choices. Um, and the issue, of course, is that what's the final common pathway that should lead us to our final decision, of course, is outcomes. 100% objective, validated, blinded, long-term assessment. None of which we can do ourselves, but all of which should be included in a real, live decision on what to do. But what do outcomes really become in a pragmatic sense? Is an outcome a good-looking film, or is it a happy patient? Well, theoretically, it should be a happy patient or, or some interaction of but in terms of the way we're training our younger generation, residents and fellows, maybe it's more and more a good-looking film. Because they really didn't do the workup. They often met the patient about the time of surgery. And they don't follow them out for six months, a year, two years, five years, when they come back with the long-term issues. And so it becomes a little like a Skinner box. You do the surgery, you put up a film, it's a nice film, you do more surgery. And interestingly, in operant conditioning, if you only reward some of the bar presses, it's harder to extinguish that behavior. So it's actually, if you put up an x-ray every once in a while, it doesn't look so good, it actually reinforces the behavior. So to some extent, it becomes that good outcomes can be proxied by good-looking films. Now, how about bad outcomes? Obviously, bad outcomes should be an unhappy patient. But on the other hand, we can always say, well, a patient's a malinger. Oh, a patient has a bad attitude. And even when we have to face up and say it's a, a not, not happy outcome, um, we can accept it as acceptable failure. And in some studies, gosh, 30%, even up to 50%, we see acceptable failure rates in comparative studies. But a fusion failure, no. You put up a film, the film's the film, that's what you get. That's an unhappy situation for us all. So the real problem is, is that in practice, the tendency is not really to have 100% objective outcomes. It's for good-looking good films to be our positive outcome and poor-looking films to be our negative outcome. And so realistically, in 2009, the setup really is that patient outcome is not our indicator. It really becomes more technical abilities. Your ability to do a surgery that you think is indicated, but to do it in a fashion that doesn't hurt the patient, hopefully it helps them, but doesn't hurt them and produces a good image. And that really means that evidence becomes replaced by anecdote. 
And that's the setup. That's the world in which we're living right now, in which evidence-based medicine is supposed to help us out of that. And that's really the, the theme when it comes to it's time to be a, it's a great time to be a spine surgeon, in that we're hoping that evidence-based medicine can reinforce the things that we do in terms of outcomes. But it isn't so easy to use. Uh, certainly, what we need to learn how to integrate evidence into our practice, what class one means to our practice, and then what class three evidence means because we have to live in a class three world. The vast majority of evidence is only class three. What do you do with that? How do you deal with anecdote? Because that's mostly what we live, where we live. So that's the focus of this lecture, and we'll try to present the evidence and then integrate it into how we practice, and then with a question and answer and case discussion sessions, hopefully we can bring the whole audience in, into those discussions and try to continue it to be a good time to be a spine surgeon in a little more evidence-based fashion. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So we'll start things off uh, by asking Randy to give us a couple of uh, very basic um, concepts of evidence and uh, what this all means. Randy. The question of evidence-based medicine is why do we do what we do, which really reflects why do we think we know what we think we know. And, and it's really a fundamental question. To a great extent, we deal with anecdote. We deal as a product of what we've experienced in our life and, and seen. Um, this is called anecdote-based medicine. And the crux is that the plural of anecdote is not evidence. Because anecdote leads to superstition. Superstition being when you believe that a correlation is a causation. And again, it can lead to practice which is not inconsistent with scientific fact. Then, of course, there's what your professor told you. We all had to remember that, even if we didn't believe it, so we could spout it back. That's called eminence-based medicine. But the crux is, 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 the, is it evidence-based? How much is anecdote? And how old was the evidence? When's the last time our professor actually read the literature? Um, there's an issue there, but we, again, we all grew up that way. And then, of course, there's meetings. This is a meeting. It's the talking head that stands up in front of you. This is eloquence-based medicine. And this also has some issues because, in truth, we really don't know the motivations or the thought patterns behind the speakers. And there's a lot of them. And it's not always clear. And, and we do this at all the meetings. We hear eminent speakers and we listen to them and how do we interpret that? What's the meaning of that? And it's a big problem. It's not peer-reviewed what we hear at meeting in, in any sense. And that's really why in an evidence report you can't add abstracts or proceedings as part of the foundation. Uh, yet eloquence-based medicine continues to be a big way of disseminating information. So what do we do with these things? Well, we can probably ignore them and laugh at them like Nisha would suggest. But in truth, we can't do that because we have to take care of patients. So we should probably use the information cautiously when we're dealing at that level. Don't overestimate its value. And be willing to change practice if more rigorous evidence appears. And I think the, the real crux there is not overestimate its value. We live in an evidence-based world. We live in an anecdote-based world. We have to remember that. We have to practice medicine, but we also need to remember the level at which we're practicing. In general, the results of a well-done trial are so much more valid than anecdote that the reader needs to ask if his or her patients are so different that the results of the study can be ignored. If it doesn't apply to your patient group, you can ignore a class one study. But if it does apply to your patient group, no matter how fond you are of your own practice patterns, it's hard to ignore that evidence. The other side is the antithesis of that. To alter one's practice based on the misconception that a poor study is actually valid is a tragedy and will lead to poor outcomes that, in the absence of solid outcome measures, we may not actually notice for quite some time. So it's important to recognize the value of a study because otherwise we can be misled and end up making changes in our practice that are wrong and that we may not actually be sensitive to, to the effects of. Again, can, I mean, I think everybody must have read this because a uh, recent uh, study of quote unquote class one studies, uh, randomized controlled trials in general orthopedics, suggests that not all level one studies are high quality, that the mean transform scores for study quality was 68% out of 100%, and that 51% of randomized trials in the orthopedic literature have important flaws that limit validity. People tend to read randomized controlled trials as level one studies. Y you really need to class them down based on those flaws. And it's unbelievable what the errors were. And I think probably one of the most egregious is reasons for excluding patients were not described. So if you can't tell the study population, you don't know if this trial, no matter how well it's done, applies to your patients. So it's almost impossible to use those data. Again, 
it's a it's a dangerous area because the liter the, the, our editors don't really filter those. Assessment of qual evidence reports when you're faced with one, it's very difficult. And it requires an empirical review of methods and analyses in the evidence report. And there's real no methods of grading an evidence report. And there's a lot of ways to fail this. And unfortunately, having done evidence reports, I've been part of, of failures before. The hardest thing really is how to uh, classify the literature. And nowadays, very commonly, you use independent literature classification groups to accomplish that, to get rid of bias. Otherwise, we're caught with our pants down. And we end up making errors that are accepted as guidelines based on misinterpretation of data. So what do we do with level of evidence and what are level of evidence? Otherwise, we can be caught and, and end up in an uncomfortable position. Basically, we have class one evidence, the most rigorous, but also the most rare. It's rigorous and useful, and it will lead to few but very powerful guidelines. And then we have class three evidence, very common, weak, not much use scientifically, Results in many but very weak suggestions. Essentially, this is the sexiest thing we've got, but usually we can't get there. This is the more common side of things, but unfortunately doesn't lead to the same response. Class two evidence lives somewhere in the middle, and that class two evidence can be very powerful and is actually more applicable probably to surgical discipline than randomized control trials. For one thing, it's somewhat hard to blind randomized control trials. Certainly, you can never blind a surgeon. Well, you probably could, but it wouldn't be a good idea. Um, and so this actually may be the holy grail. We really underestimate the value of good class two evidence, um, but ne nevertheless, it might actually be that for which we should strive in a lot of cases. Now, are we mandated to practice according to evidence-based medicine? Um, how should we approach it? Well, for class one evidence is yes. This represents principles that reflect a high degree of clinical certainty. It can be thought of as the method to use in the absence of extenuated circumstances. You should think of it first, and unless it's contraindicated, that's the way you should go. If it pertains to your patient cohort, and if it's working. Obviously, if it's not working, you go another direction. But class one evidence should lead you to practice. Unfortunately, it's not very common. On the other hand, um, it, if we ignore it, we're not practicing solid medicine. How about class two evidence or class three evidence? Do we ignore them, or do we deal with them? Well, in order to practice medicine, we really have to deal with them. Class two evidence represents principles reflecting a moderate degree of clinical certainty. The method of treatment that's probably the best choice in the majority of clinical applications. You should think of class two evidence first. You're not mandated to follow up, but it should be the first on your consideration list. And I think we saw that in the SPORT trial, where the randomized control trials kind of fell apart. But the real value of the trial was in the, the prospective part of that study. Um, <clears throat> And so class two evidence can really be very useful. Probably has the most to offer clinical medicine, and it should really override your own personal experience in the majority of cases. And then, of course, there's class three evidence. These have unclear clinical certainty. Things aren't tested against each other, and they're not tested rigorously. There can be no causation implied in class three studies. They essentially result as published anecdotes, and we need a lot of caution with them. They can be thought of as a suggested treatment method without proven superiority over other applicable methods. They're rarely well tested, and they're almost never properly tested against alternatives. <clears throat> so what do we do when a guidelines comes out and makes recommendations based on class three evidence? Why should we believe that? Well, the advantage is it was developed by a group that just lived intimately with the literature for a year or two. So hopefully, in an unbiased fashion, they've, they've summarized what floated to the top. The disadvantage is it's almost impossible to get rid of your bias, and that each of us needs to interpret those suggestions at a class three level in terms of our own reality. And that's the only way to put them into practice, and that's the most valid way. So realistically, what are the recommendations in this age, at this stage of evidence-based medicine? Well, it's clearly here to stay, and certainly I think we've accepted it as clear to stay. Class one studies should change our practice when they come out. Class two evidence should strongly influence our practice. And I think really one of the things we should do is produce more solid class two evidence. Class three evidence, which is where we live most of the time, should provide us with alternatives to consider, remembering their class two evidence, and that if it isn't working, we can change it, no matter how much investment we have it in our own experience. An evidence report is a service for the clinician to help understand the available literature based only on its quality. The final decision in an individual case will always rest with the physician.
Thank you. <laughs> so I think you'll agree this was a very valuable uh, first primer. Next I'll ask Dr. David Flum, Professor of General Surgery at the University of Washington to come up here. Uh, Dr. Flum you'll recognize as uh, one of the leaders of state-based, uh, evidence-based medicine applications on a number of applications. He, for instance, heads the uh, health technology assessments in the state of Washington. Uh, he's also uh, actually in practical reality created, as you'll see, one of the statewide registries in general surgery. And uh, we all are very interested to see how this might be applicable for a spine. So, David, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. So, as an outsider, I thought I would maybe take a look at evidence-based spine surgery with you. Uh, the idea being that we often look, talk about evidence-based surgery as if it's an individual's choice to make uh, whether or not they're going to interpret the results of a randomized trial and bring it into their practice. But I spend a lot of time talking with people who are not surgeons, who are trying to make policy decisions about how surgeons should carry out their practice. And they look at your field and our field, the surgical fields in general, from a totally different perspective. I thought I would show how outsiders view uh, surgery show the terms and limits of evidence-based medicine and trying to change that perception of the way surgery is viewed, and then show you an alternative that is much more physician-empowering, much more surgeon-led, uh, which is a, a grassroots initiative leading surgeons together to, to really take the reins of evidence-based care and do it in a smart way, not a way that's top-down or something that Medicare is making you do, but something that will enrich patients' uh, outcomes and, and your practices, and that's a community-based approach to to incorporating evidence into practice. So I'm going to be defining the problem as others see it in surgery. And I want to emphasize it's the way others see it, because most of you are not making policy in your own fields. It's being done to you. I want to define the terms of evidence-based medicine a little bit differently and also its limits. And then I'm going to suggest how at least several fields in Washington State, general surgery, vascular surgery, pediatric surgery, bariatric surgery, are charting a new course to an incorporate evidence-based care really in a smart way that's empowering to docs. First, I want to show you the way you're viewed by others. It, it's, a, it's a form of pathologic variability that is used to describe surgery. Variability in everything from how often surgery is used to the cost of surgery to the outcomes of surgery. The Dartmouth Atlas, which many of you are familiar with, looks at the number of procedures done per thousand Medicare enrollees. And in this famous map of the United States, the darker areas are where Medicare is spending more dollars per thousand Medicare enrollees, and the variability in colors tells a picture. I think Atul Gwandi described this in a New, York, New Yorker article about three months ago called the cost conundrum that was carried by Obama around the White House, saying, why can't we address this cost variability? But look at a different part of this slide, which is the numbers of these bodies, these four bodies here, these five bodies here. These bodies represent the number of coronary artery bypass grafts that are done per thousand Medicare enrollees. Look at these stable environments where there's no shortage of doctors in Miami. Trust me, my parents live there. They spend their time, all their time at the doctor's office. Five per thousand in Miami, four per thousand in Boston. And then look at these hotbeds of coronary disease, nine per thousand in Chattanooga, 13 per thousand in Redding, California. Now, what's going on there? To an outsider, that, shows, that suggests that the medical communities in those areas are having different thresholds for when they're choosing to have a coronary artery bypass graft. There's no physiologic reason there should be so much heart disease and so much increased athero atherosclerosis. I've been to Reading. It's a pretty nice place, not, so, not, not such a high-stress environment. From an outsider's perspective, they look at this variability in the use of surgery as a very worrisome sign. I'll show it to you a different way. You know, some people call this appropriateness of care. Was that cabbage, was that coronary bypass graft the right operation for the right patient at the right time? This is the use of back surgery nationwide. It's a little tricky to understand these maps. These are called turnip plots. The turnip plots say that these are the, each one of these blue dots represents a referral area in the nation, a place where there's community hospitals, quaternary hospitals, a high, you know, high volume uh, university hospitals. Each one of the dots represents a community in a nation. And the number of back operations per thousand Medicare enrollees ranges from one to ten per thousand. That same, this is another way of looking at that same map I just showed you. Now what drives that? I was recently giving a talk in Pennsylvania, and, and this is the map, this is the overlay of all the different regions in Pennsylvania that are, that, that are on that map. And all the red dots are the red dots that represent the regions in Pennsylvania. Look at the variability just in that state. But take two areas, 
Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, where there's certainly a lot of doctors, and look at the variability in those two regions and how often they're using back surgery per thousand. From an outsider's perspective, this looks very worrisome, like we can't figure out who should have back surgery, why they should have back surgery, and if it's clinically indicated. It gets a little bit to what it's viewed as the, what are viewed as the drivers of care. In an ideal world, you'd think a doctor is making an evidence-based decision and delivering care. We all know it's a little more unglued than that. This is some work that's done by one of the PhD candidates in your own department, Brooke Martin. This shows you the use of, of, of fusion operations month by month in the 90s up through 1996 and the spike up that occurs when fusion cages are introduced by the FDA. This is one of those drivers of care that outsiders say, look at it and say, how is it that all this extra surgery gets done as soon as there's new technology that's introduced? But as you know, the evidence about what's the best approach for fusions has emerged, and certainly some of that evidence suggests that there are better alternatives. Understanding how much of this spike is driven by the technology versus how much of it is driven by genuine patient care, that's a challenge for outsiders. It's especially challenging for outsiders when you see articles like this that come out of the New York Times that uh, shows that the FDA being strongly influenced to push new te technology on the market, influenced here by senators that are making, putting pressure on the FDA, undoubtedly because of corporate pressure. So there are a lot of drivers of clinical care that are worrisome, but it's not as worrisome as the variability in outcome. This is, same, this is additional work by Brooke that looks across the state of Washington. Each one of these bars is a hospital in the state of Washington. And this shows the rates of four-year reoperation rate, how often somebody who had an index operation for a, a decompression gets another operation within the next four years. And although the average is uh, uh, hovering around here, there are hospitals that are in the 20 range and hospitals that are in the 10 percent range. The bars are the, are the range for the sport trial, just to give you a sense of, of how much variability there is. And I'd argue that patients don't know that they're walking into a hospital with this kind of reoperation rate. Perhaps the surgeons don't know that they, their patients that they operated on four years ago are having this rate of reoperation, but it's quite worrisome from an outsider's perspective. Here you see the same slide. Each one of these spikes now is a surgeon in the state of Washington. Now, one of the things about this kind of variability is that I, sus I suspect surgeons over at this extreme here, who have a 25% reoperation rate, have no idea that they are that surgeon. And that is the problem with, with data like these, that they're used as outsiders to say, look at the problem in the quality of care delivery. But from my perspective, this is the way you start using evidence. You benchmark off of one another, understanding what drives that variability in reoperation. Is it the patients? If it's the patients, let's adjust for that. Is it my practice pattern? Is it the technique I'm using? And we learn from one another. That, to me, is how to integrate evidence-based medicine into surgery. The last bit is cost. You know, there's no conversation going on greater than the cost conversation now in Washington. How do you contain costs? And all of us have a role as stewards of healthcare resources in containing costs. I'll just show you this last slide of Brooks, which looks at the healthcare utilization, healthcare costs associated with technology. Look at the look at the dollars and thousands on the y-axis, and as they spike up in 1998 with that same introduction of new technology, we're talking about sixty thousand dollars per case charges per hospital for fusion operation. That kind of, that kind, those kind of costs get people's attention. And that, that slope really gets folks' attention. I thought I'd give you a perspective on the way policymakers are trying to use evidence into practice. They say that there's a different type of leveling of evidence. There's leveling of evidence that says, what would you do for your own, for, your, for yourself, for your family? That's the lowest quality of evidence, perhaps. Level two, what would I recommend to my patient or client? And level three, what would I recommend for the state or the nation? And decisions about, the, about how policy will go down is focusing on this level. And they're looking for the meta-analysis. They're only anchoring to the meta-analysis. And if you don't see the meta-analysis, they're not willing to make a policy decision. And that's where this scope project comes in. The Surgical Care and Outcomes Assessment Program is about four years old in Washington State. It gathered surgeons from every hospital across the state of Washington to define what are the metrics that make good care. It may be evidence-based on the highest level with randomized trials. For the most part, it's, 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 it's eminence-based or, or practice-based. What, what experienced docs say, that tends to work in my community. Those docs then get their hospitals to agree to track on that for every case, every operation that they do. And then docs get benchmarking reports back. 
It's unique. It's, there's really not another state that has anything like this. It's clinician-led using clinical data, not the billing data that all of us know and, 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 and hate, frankly. Um, but it's docs driving the idea of evidence-based care, of integrating evidence into practice by benchmarking off of one another. And its focus is on quality and cost. The source of the data for benchmarking comes from the medical record. The, the, the change is behavior, and this is the trick with evidence-based care. If we rely on evidence-based care just as an individual choice, it'll never happen. But if you change behavior based on benchmarking, when's the last time any of you got a report card? When's the last time you got a performance report that says how you're doing? Benchmarking off of this, colleagues saying, I do it this way and look, these are the results we're getting with real high quality data, that benchmarking is an, a, a tremendous force for change. Along with education and standardization, that's the way you change a community to bottom up approach. So scope started as a good idea with one or two hospitals in Seattle and it spread like wildfire. It's a voluntary initiative. For a voluntary, voluntary initiative to spread like this in every sector of the state, hospitals are voluntarily paying for participation in this. Docs, hundreds of them now, are getting newsletters once a month and reports once a quarter showing how they're doing compared to their colleagues. The docs pick the metrics, they own the metrics, and it's non-discoverable. It's a pretty exciting activity. It's exciting just in concept, but it's also exciting when you look at things that patients care about. These are rates of reoperative complications this is in colon surgery, but you could fill in that slide for spine surgery. You can drive improvements in quality over time, having the rates of reoperative complications, in this case colon surgery, by this kind of benchmarking. And we do it by changing behavior. You know, in scope, this is, I picked one metric. How often do you check for a leak in the operating room when you're doing colon surgery? And we see we're driving the rates of that leak testing up quarter by quarter by benchmarking on the simple technique of just checking the tire to make sure it doesn't have a hole in it. You know, it's not complicated. That's what, that's what we're doing. Now, we also drive evidence-based care this way. Here is avoiding transfusions and elective surgery. You almost see this becoming a never event. Here is driving the better diabetes management in the operating room, getting evidence into the operating room. Here it's getting more lymph nodes, all those lines going up because it's surgeons using benchmarking to drive evidence into their practice. Scope's only three years old, and I'm talking to you about it because I think you should do spine scope. We focused on recruitment over three years. We've created uh, the, the template for building other professions onto it. Vascular's coming on board. Urology's coming on board. We're, we were, we're focusing on building recruitment and strategic growth with other, other, other clinici clinical groups. But scope links to the Board of Surgery and links to a checklist that helps change care. The goal is to change change practice based on good evidence, and, and we do that through benchmarking. So this is the scope map, and I, the question to you is, what's it going to take to make the spine scope map actually happen in Washington? I'd argue this is a very practical way to bring evidence-based care, not just into your practice, but into your whole community. Thank you. You get really humble when you, when you listen to all these studies and uh, randomized control trials, multi-center trials, and so forth. And uh, the context is that you can do whatever you want. It, nobody knows anything. And it's about approximately the same message I've heard now for 20 years, 25 years. So I don't think it's very strange that the authorities come down on us and say, hey, what are you doing? It's also that when, when there are some so-called landmark studies and, uh, or other uh, level one or level two studies, that the results we do not follow. This sends a clear message to the authorities, to those who have responsibility for the money. I mean, we must be credible. How do we earn our credibility? We can talk as, as much as we want about this, but we must when we talk about gold standard, what is gold standard? When I say that uninstrumented lumbar fusion is gold standard for degenerative disc disease with lumbar back pain, this means that if I do an instrumented fusion, I have to think twice. If I say that gold standard is instrumented fusion, then I, I will do this all the time then it, it will be more or less impossible for me to do a, a non-uninstrumented fusion. And we know that uninstrumented fusion 
have the exactly the same results from level one studies. Nobody in this audience said we do uninstrumented lung refusions. So why? The result in the register is, tells the same story, the same result. Well, is this true then? Is it the same result? Or is it a matter, in fact, of patient selection? We know when we uh, uh, discussed the predictors of outcome in the Swedish lumbar spine study that if you had 50% decrease of disc height, you had better results. So maybe this is a good predictor. Maybe if you have 50% reduction of disc height, you can avoid using instrumentation. It could be one way of thinking instead of saying, we instrument all. Because this is not supported in the literature. And still we do it. Do you know how many percentage of cases in Sweden, uh, uh, how many patients do we instrument? Lumbar pain, segmental pain, degenerative disc disease. How many percent do we instrument per year? In Sweden, I think I guessed 70%? 95%. So there must be something wrong here. <coughs> Why are we doing these studies? Why are we discussing these results when we can do whatever we like? So we come back, we can do a cost effectiveness trial. We can do something which is cost effective. So what is cost effective? It's a new language. We cannot discuss with the administrators, we cannot discuss with the politicians, because they do not do know our trade, and they will never do it. But they know about money, and so do we. So we can discuss cost effectiveness in the nominator, money, and denominator, treatment effects. Maybe we can define this, and we have to do it as physicians or therapists, to gain credibility, to be able to decide in the future what should be done, what investigations should be done, what treatments should be carried out. If we don't do it this way in a credible way, they will do it for us. Building a spine registry, this is my first presentation. What is a registry? Key messages, it's a passive collection of data that can be used actively. It reflects the whole population, no comparison group. It reflects the real world. It gives a possibility of high external validity. So it generates hypotheses, so it's extremely important. The register doesn't give any explanations, and that's very important. So it leaves us with the question, who are going to give these explanations? Is it the authorities or is it us? I think we should take the lead here. And we can't do that if we consistently say there is no evidence, we do, can do whatever we want, and we do whatever we want, and the costs keep on rising. They don't respect us then. I speak for Sweden only. So interested parties here in society, hospital, healthcare sectors and physicians, researchers, patients, relatives and third party payers, insurance companies. And this is one of the questions with a misuse of registered data. So what if the insurance company gets hold of the data and says, hey, you have 50% risk of having low back pain in the future. You will have no money for us. We, we, we don't uh, take your money and you will have no money from us. I think this is a, that is a real danger. Is this happening in, in the States? It is, yeah. I think this is unworthy for a rich country. I think I'm only speaking about Sweden. I think that we should 
you know, take care of each other. It's all about clinical results for us, and it's all about money for the society. And this leaves us with cost effectiveness. Fusion rate is uh, raising in the United States and in Sweden. So why should we use a spine register? It's in the interest of all parties, or is it? Do you want to have your data public from your clinic? If we agree on the register, what should we register? We should agree on the data. It has taken us five years to agree on data. Endless meetings, annual meetings. I'm talking about the Swedish spine surgeons. So we don't agree. I don't think that you agree in this audience. What should we measure? And how should we measure? Different solutions, flexibility. When? Continuously. Who should do it? Not physicians. I'm talking about Sweden. It won't work. It's absolutely hopeless. It's a dead end. You have to include other people to get the data. Analysis, publication, and ownership, we should have that. We should do that. So the aims of the radius is to improve our results. We, uh, we check the quality. We compare our clinic with all other clinics. I will show you in a second. Uh, we can at least theoretically um, uh, discuss cost effectiveness. We can do research. And it's a, a register is, is, is a very, very good tool to detect complications and serious events. You cannot detect this in randomized uh, controlled trials. A register is the best way of capturing complications. And you can do com comparisons. Sweden, 9 million people, 45 departments, and we do approximately uh, 9,000 procedures per year, meaning 1,000 procedures per 1 million citizens. I don't know, don't know how that compares with the states. We cover the whole spine, all diagnostic entities, all surgical procedures, all implants. We are web-based, patient-based, the patients are filling in all the protocols, all the documents. The only responsibility for the surgeon is the surgical procedure. It is secretary driven and surgeon's role minimized. We have built this from bottom to top. It has taken now 10 years, 98 to 2009, 11 years. It was in 93. It was initiated, initiated in 93, but then only nine, eight or nine clinics were included. All members, annual meetings, as I said, telephone conferences. We have a registered group of four spine surgeons. We have a publishing group of nine spine surgeons constantly discussing all issues. It's very easy to get access to data for researchers. We produce annual reports, and we have online access for all departing clinics on their results. Here are some examples of data, sociodemographics. We use back pain, leg pain, SF36, Oswestry, and uh, EQ5D, a generic health-related quality of life instrument. We use, uh, these are the basic instruments we use. And we have, of course, surgical data. The pre-op evaluation is patient-based surgical data. The only obligation takes him 30 seconds, lumbar degenerative uh, condition, three minutes perhaps if you have scoliosis, angles, and so forth. <clears throat> and one year, two year, five year, 10 years follow-up, uh, mailed questionnaires to, <coughs> to the patient. The doctors and the physicians never see this. 90% of all departments are registering, 75% of all procedures included. 
75% follow up after one year, 60% after two years. So we are concentrating on the follow up now. We have one national server and all these different departments all connect to this server. And data can be transferred in, bo transferred in both directions. We have just supplement supplemented with a, a squeeze by in study application, which means that you can construct your own instruments and you can get data from, from the national server and get this to your uh, study. You can compare your own data with the national data and you can also compare all different departments in Sweden with all other, de other departments. This means that we can say that in Sweden anyway, 12% of what we are talking about today is 12% uh, of all spinal procedures in Sweden is performed for degenerative disc disease. I don't know the figure in the United States, but... It's about 30%. 30%. It's very interesting because <clears throat> degenerative disc disease, this is the main topic. This is the thing we discuss with the authorities, with, with, with anyone who says uh, we, you shouldn't do this and that. I mean, lumbar disc herniation, no problem. Spinal stenosis, no problem. This is the thing, segmental pain. And this is also where the money is. So what have you learned from the register? One thing that gives us credibility. This is quality of life. One is death, sorry, zero is death, one is perth perfect quality of life. And this is the blue bars here, is preoperative data on lumbar disc herniation, central spinal stenosis, lateral stenosis, spondylo, and degenerative disc disease. And you see, we are very low preoperative quality of life. It's lower than depression, cancer. So what we can say now to the authorities and everyone, who doubts in our trade is this is what we accomplish. We double quality of life for our patients. And this is the most powerful tool, at least in Sweden, that we have ever accomplished. So the success factors for us before we go online, it's a bottom top concept, extreme democracy. Server placed outside the university and that's very important. Because if you have a national server within the university, there are many, many factors that you cannot really control. Uh, there are control mechanisms, and suddenly you get, don't get access to your data. The National Society owns the data. We have dedicated secretaries. We have support online on working hours. We have this, as I said, register group and publishing group. It's patient-based, surgical role marginalized, uh, easy access to, uh, to data for all researchers, and so forth. So did it help us? Because this, this is what we want from a register. Did it help us? Did it help spine surgery? Yes, it did. We have shown that we can increase, we can double quality of life for almost all Diagnostic, diagnostic entities. And it is very important when we negotiate with decision makers, especially for the private clinics, the private departments. And we have one online feedback, which is important, because what's in it for me, for you, for me, that is the key, really, to get the register to work. And if I just get data into a national server but get nothing back, I will stop producing data. So now I will go online and press on the English flag and you are welcome. Press, press the results and the interpretation. All results that we produce online, this is for the public. We analyze very, very carefully because otherwise 
we will influence people, patients going to different clinics, believing erroneously that results differ, which they may do, but very seldom do. Press diagnosis here, this is just an example, and disc herniation. Procedures. Here are all the different departments in Sweden. And uh, here there's a percentage of follow-up after one year. This is a national mean, 75% follow-up after one year. And here you can easily compare your own clinic to the national mean. And so can anybody else. We have a case mix duration of pain before surgery. This blue bar here is pain, leg pain below three months. Does that matter? Yes, it does. We have shown with this data that if you have pain less than three months, you have, a, you have better results. And this clinic, one specific clinic in Stockholm, 45% of their patients are operated on within three months. How do you do this? This was the first thing I did. I picked up the phone and I called them. And I got a lot of explanation which, you know, told me they really didn't know. It generates hypothesis. This clinic operates 3% of their patients within three months. And these bars up here, they operate on this coordination over 24 months. So why? Length of stay in hospital. This is one, two, three, four, five days. Very simple data. National mean is three days. And here's uh, some departments, two days. So why are some departments here on five days? Or, for, sorry, four days. And why are not all departments having two days? This costs money, and there is a bed occupied. I think this is cultural. This is in the so-called, so it's in the walls. We have always done like this. It doesn't explain why, but it makes you think. And hopefully do something. And I will end with some results. Perceived results on, <coughs> on leg pain. Remember, this is lumbar disc herniation. And here are all the departments in Sweden reporting. National mean greatly improved. This is the blue bar here. And the national mean is close to 80%. So there are some clinics above national mean and some clinics clearly below. So why? Again, this why. This is an interesting picture because this is, what was your leg pain like before surgery? And this is a 100 graded VAS scale. This is maximum pain, this is zero pain. So the national mean is 60, approximately 65. I think you recognize this figure. It used to come out approximately 60, 65 in all studies. And this is also a, a sort of validation between the registers and the study. And this shaded area here is the confidence intervals. And here are the different clinics. Here's one clinic with significantly more back pain before surgery than the national mean. But more important, also significantly more pain after one year compared with national mean, because this is the result after one year. This means we do not cure these, our patients. These are degenerative diseases. We make them better. And this goes for lumbar disc herniations also. 75% of all patients, and I'm talking about thousands and thousands of lumbar disc herniations, uh, patients with lumbar disc herniations, are satisfied with surgery, completely satisfied, 75% in Sweden. Somewhat satisfied, 85, 90%. Dissatisfied, 10% after one year. 
So, I mean, this colleague in this specific hospital, he phoned me three times this morning when this was ma made public. We ex accidentally was February this year. So, what is the explanation? I asked him. Um, well, I don't know. There are many immigrants here where I live. Could be. Because they could, could perceive a, 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 a vast scale or a quality of life totally different from, from, from Swedish citizens. So this is what you have to analyze. He says, no, I don't give any answers here, just hypotheses. And finally, just the same for quality of life same picture. And quality of life measured with EQ5D is important because you can use EQ5D to analyze cost effectiveness. So I sincerely advise you, if you plan to do a study, include this instrument. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mike Jansen is going to let us know about his experience with the uh, total disc arthroplasty trials and give us some insight on that. Thank you. I'd uh, like to just kind of give you an overview of what it's really like to do these types of clinical projects in the real world, and especially when the FDA is uh, uh, breathing down on you when you do these kind of clinical trials. <clears throat> Why would we do this? What's the real benefit? of doing an FDA clinical IDE trial. We've talked a lot about what the benefit of a registry is, but what's the real benefit? Well, in theory, it gives you access to this new cutting technology. It provides patients with something we think may be effective very early in the investigation. There may be some financial rewards if you have some interest in some of these technologies. You probably can get on the podium and do a lot of early on academic publications, whether or not they're good or bad. And you may be viewed as an expert and some of this new and expanding technology for these new therapeutic events. The reality is, is there's a lot of different types of clinical trials. <clears throat> and in the United States alone, it's estimated there's about 3.5 million people involved in a clinical trial at any one time. But there are risks involved. You have legal exposure. You have to manage these patients, whether you like them or not, for two years, five years, seven years, and sometimes ten. You have problems with enrollment because you always think it's going to be easy to enroll because you think you see all these kind of pathologies routinely. You're going to have financial exposure. I've known uh, people that have been involved in clinical trials with the company. The company goes bankrupt. You still got to continue to follow those patients, and there's no funding whatsoever. So you do have financial exposure, too. There is a substantial office disruption, and you really need to make sure that you have the ability to publish um, irrespective of the outcome. Now, I can't go through all of the evolutions of human research. I really want to cover three key things today in the next few minutes. What does it take to get a project FDA approved? Who's responsible when you run a clinical project like this, because it's very unique, and how, why would you ever want to do this? Why should you get involved in a clinical project? There's about 8,000 medical devices every year that's marketed in North America. Most of them are low-risk devices, casts, braces, um, bandages, and so they, they're a real, uh, real non-issue. About 45% of them are considered um, medium risk, endoscopes, new scans, and a variety of things, and only a small percentage of them have to go through a full market approval or a PMA. About 100 of them out of the 800 truly are what's considered high risk to undergo the evaluation process. We are regulated, highly regulated in North America, and this is just a, a few of the regulations that's involved in any time you want to run a clinical trial for a medical device. Now, it's really easy to do pharmaceutical trials compared to spine trials. Yes, in pharmaceutical trials, they have large numbers, and in spine trials, you have a small number of patients, you have an intervention, either they got procedure A or they got procedure B, and you have to kind of sort these two things out. But it's much easier, obviously, just to give them a pill than it is to try to blind a surgical procedure. That's what makes it a challenge. This is the take the, one of the most important messages, is that you think you can just hire a study coordinator, then you have the x-ray, you have billing, you have surgery scheduler. All these people are really the ones supposed to be responsible for your clinical trial. The reality is, is that you, as a clinical investigator, are the fall person for all of these clinical trials. Who's responsible? Well, first of all, the sponsor's responsible, because they're helping fund the study, and they're responsible to help you get the approval through the FDA for the IDE. They're responsible for the protocol, for the investigation, for your contract with them to help support the finances in a variety of aspects. The IRB, 
an institutional review board, and I've sat on many of these sometimes, they really are, the goal is to take a look at the rights and the welfare of the, of the subjects that you're actually involved in enrolling. But the reality is, is you have to really stop and take a look. Are you well prepared for a true FDA audit? Because if you're going to be involved in these research, then you have to understand what's going to happen. The first thing you do is you have to inform the sponsor that you're going to be audited by the Food and Drug Administration, or they're already there because most of the time they just show up. You have to inform your clinical monitors. You have to inform the institutional review board. You have to have all your documents ready. You have to have everything up to date, and you have to be there the whole time. So what are they looking for? They want to know who did what. They want to know who you authorized to do anything. They want to know where the data is, who accounted for the data, who had access to the data. Did the cleaning people that were in here have access to the cabinets where the data was? Um, and is there any conflicts of interest? Conflicts of interest. It's always an interesting topic. What does conflict of interest mean? I like to use this slide right here. If you take a look at this and you ask a group of medical students and a group of nurse practitioners, is it okay for a public official to accept a $50 gift from a contractor? What do you think? Well, 85% of the students say no. There's a conflict of interest. 97% of the nurse practitioners think there's a conflict of interest. If you ask medical students, is it okay for a medical student to accept a $50 gift from a drug firm? The same group, well, only half the medical students think it's a problem now, but yet most of the nurse practitioners think it's a problem. On the other hand, if you ask a nurse if it's okay for her to take a $50 book from somebody, then they think that there's no problem. So conflict of interest has to do with where you come from. So the real purpose for the FDA to show up at your practice is to look at the safety, the validity of it, and they want to check everything that you have. So why would you do this? Well, I think we all have a moral obligation to advance science. We have a moral obligation to look at technology. It assures some excellence and some leadership of really looking what we think is the best thing to do. But it's, a very cha it's challenging. It disrupts your office. It's very expensive. But a lot of industrial companies come up to doctors today and says, Mike, we want you to run a clinical project for us. Sometimes there's no merits to the technology. They just want you to use their technology. Sometimes you have to really decide if you want to be involved and who else is involved to make those kind of decisions because it's a major undertaking. Thank you. Thank you.